and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accused or accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of, of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they, them, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for, whom, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the latter and is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of, of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Please be seated. We again want to thank each one of you for being here tonight. It's always a blessing to be able to come together and to worship God, and we appreciate you that are here. I appreciate the songs that Brother Terry picked out there that are appropriate for my lesson tonight which is speaking on Satan as our enemy, one that we have to deal with daily as we live our Christian lives, Satan. And uh, remember what Jesus said about Satan in John 8 and verse 44. He says that he is the father of the lie concerning Satan. And so we find that he is very deceptive in his work and living among us as we try to live our lives. We constantly are bombarded with decisions to make in our life, whether to do what is right or to do what is wrong. And many times because of the pressures that we experience from various sources, many times these decisions are quite difficult. And it seems to me that we have to weigh the consequences of the results of those decisions. Remember in Ephesians, the fourth chapter in verse 15, it says very clearly, it tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. And so here we have the Almighty God, the sustainer of life. And on the other hand, we have Satan or the devil. We need to understand that Satan is truly our enemy, and he is actively involved to draw us away and try to destroy us. Satan is so powerful. And we use all the devices to gain control of our lives. I want us to notice in Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning there in verse 1, and the temptations that Jesus experienced from Satan. In verse 1 it says that Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of 
the devil. Remember, this was just after Jesus was baptized there in the River Jordan, and Satan came into his way. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. And when the tempter, that is Satan, or the devil, when he came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now remember, Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Satan knew the weaknesses, the hunger that existed there. And so he tempted him in that respect. But Jesus was so strong, in verse 4 he says, He answered and said on each occasion, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil then takes him up into, upon a holy city, and he setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he says to him, If thou be the Son of Man, the Son of God, cast thyself down. He says, For it is written, notice Satan quoting Scripture, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time the dash of foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him once again, He said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So here we find the temptation of Jesus after he was baptized in the River Jordan. And you and I experience the same temptations from Satan when we become a child of God. He will entice us with various appeals. He will lie to us and he will deceive us as he did Eve in the Garden of Eden. And see, one of the most powerful means that Satan uses is the word of discouragement, trying to discourage us. And so we want to look at some of the scriptures tonight, whether God warns us of the power and the influence of Satan or the devil. In the second letter to Corinthians, Paul said in chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. God has told us of the way that Satan will use these vices in our lives. This verse says that we are not ignorant. We're not ignorant of those words or those ways that Satan attacks each one of us. And therefore, if we are aware, he should not be able to gain an advantage in the struggle for the control of our lives. And many of the problems that we face on a daily basis are caused by none other than Satan, trying to trap us, trying to drag us, our soul, into eternal punishment that Jesus speaks of there in Matthew 25 and 46, everlasting or eternal punishment. That's what Satan wants. And you see, we cannot lose sight of the fact that during these struggles, we need to understand that God wants all of us to be saved. He wants all of us to be warded off the influences of Satan. Because in 2 Peter, the third chapter, in verse 9, it very clearly reveals this truth, this promise that God has made to us, assures us of his plan of eternal life with him. Notice in verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us to change our life. He wants to push Satan out of our lives. And this verse clearly tells us that God is being long-suffering, or God is being patient with us. He doesn't want a single one of us to be lost. He wants all of us to repent. He wants us to move away from those powerful influences that Satan has 
You see, Satan wants all of us to serve him. But on the other hand, God wants us to serve him also. But in Matthew the 6th chapter in verse 33, Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, All these things will be given to you. God loves us. And he keeps us with us. He keeps up with us. Because in Matthew the 10th chapter there in verse 30, he says, But the very hours of your head are all numbered. That means that you and I are more than just a number in the sight of God. That God loves us. He expects each one of us to bring our lives in harmony with His will. He expects each one of us to put Him first in our life rather than Satan and his enticements. You see, God has given you and me an alternative. He has provided us with salvation if we will obey Him. And if we do not obey Him, then God, then the devil, or Satan, has control of our lives. Paul tells us as he writes to those of Thessalonica, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 8, he tells us, "...and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." Satan is so active today... He is actively working to obtain as many followers as he can while we are here living on this earth. And then he has us permanently if we follow him to the end. You see, Satan wants you and I, but God wants us. If he can put obstacles, if Satan can put obstacles in our way to keep us out of the Lord's church, then he has won the battle He's won the battle for our services. If you are staying out of the Lord's church, did you know that Satan is pleased? When we miss the assemblies of the church, Satan is so happy. You see, you're giving him what he most desires. That is for you to serve him. To serve him rather than serving God. God clearly says that we cannot serve both. Look at the words of Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in his Sermon on the Mount. Now, in Matthew 6, verse 24, he says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve both God and Satan at the same time. We're either one or the other. I've heard people many times will say that religion will drive you crazy. The only time that religion will drive us crazy if we're trying to serve God and if we're trying to serve Satan at the same time. We find there in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, in verse 15 and 16, it says, I want you to look at what Jesus said. What he said about the church at Laodicea. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will that thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see, are we with the devil? Or are we on God's side? This is a question that each of us need to consider in our lives. And obviously, obviously God is not willing to share us with Satan because of these verses that we looked at. Satan tells you and me to not invite people to worship, to not tell our friends about Jesus and family. Don't tell friends. Don't tell family about Jesus Christ and His saving power. You see, that's the work of Satan. That's how he works. And on the other hand, look what God tells us through inspiration of the Bible in 2 Timothy. The second chapter there in verse 2, it says, The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able 
to teach others also. God says that you and I as faithful New Testament Christians, we have the responsibility to teach others so that they can ward off the vices of Satan. Teach them. Teach them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature as we are actively involved in as a congregation here at Hilldale. Mark 16 and verse 15. Satan tells us that we are too tired many times to spend time in encouraging others. He may tell us at times that we are just not smart enough. You see, God has, He knows the very hairs of our head. He has those counted. He knows everything about us. And don't you think that He knows what kind of ability that you and I have? So are we using this ability, or are we listening to Satan? Satan knows all spiritual blessings are in Christ. He does not want us to be in Christ. In Ephesians 1, in verse 3, it tells us there, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So Satan does not want us. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Satan does not want us in the body of Christ. He does not want us. He knows that those saved are in the church. Because in Acts 2 and verse 47, very clearly Satan knows the Scripture. It tells in verse 47, it says, Praising God and, and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Satan knows that verse. So it does not surprise him that he wants us to stay out of the Lord's church. He's trying to deceive us that we must not be in the Lord's church in order to be saved. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter there, in verse 27, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So this is the body of the saved, that Jesus will deliver us up to God at the end. How do we know that? Paul tells us through inspiration in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. He tells us there in verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of the church to God the Father in heaven. So Satan does not want us to be in Christ. As I mentioned a few moments ago, when Jesus was baptized, that's when Satan came at him and tempted him with all his forces. And even after we become New Testament Christians, you see, Satan does not give up on us. He can cause us enough heartaches. He can cause us enough problems and difficulties that many times we will return to the world from where we came. Then Satan certainly wins. Look at what Simon Peter said about Satan. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant. That means be alert, be aware, because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I want us to have a mental picture of a huge lion that's walking around in our yard and he is waiting for the opportunity to consume us, devour us, walking around with us in our life, to catch us in weak moments that he might snare us from the hand of God. You see, we, God has not left us without information on the devices that Satan uses to deceive us and consume our life. It is highly possible that one can become a Christian and let the things in this life cause him to stumble or be entangled again. And we've seen this happen so much, and, and as Rory read just a few moments ago, I want to share the words with you again there in Second Peter 2. And I want us to look at verse 20 and 21. It says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that they are entangled therein, in other words, going back, 
and overcome. He says the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. In other words, before you even became a Christian, after you become a Christian, if you go back into that world entangled with the sins of the world, he says that latter state is worse. Better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, he said, than after they have known it to turn again from the holy commandments delivered unto them. The devil knows this. And so as long as life exists within us, Satan is going to be there. He has a chance. Remember when he was testing Jesus. When he was tempted Jesus, it says that he went away for a season, a short time. That is, in our lives when Satan tempts us, when he tries to devour us, he may leave us for a while, but he will come back. And the latter state is worse than the beginning. In the time of Christ, during that first century, we find many who started out following Jesus, but we find that they fell to the wayside. We find today when many people become New Testament Christians, Satan comes after them. He is so powerful and he's so influential in their lives that when they're weak in the faith, that he's able to overcome them. But the people that followed Jesus, those disciples in the first century, they were no different than us. We find in the Gospel of John there, the sixth chapter in verse 66, from that time, it says many of his disciples, they went back and walked no more with him. Those disciples that were following Jesus, they turn back and no longer walk with Him. And as I mentioned, sometimes we see people today that many times we see people today when the going gets tough, that they give up and turn away from the Lord. Another way that Satan attacks us is more by a subtle way, a subtle means. He can let us, he decides to let us remain in the fellowship of the church, with the church. But he can render us worthless as a follower of Jesus Christ. We know that Satan will certainly compromise the truth. If he can't totally win us, therefore we're not acceptable to God. If we compromise with Satan and God's ways. He comes to us in all forms to tempt us. Jesus said in Matthew the 7th chapter there in verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are raving wolves. He will corrupt. He will corrupt the Word of God. As I mentioned a few moments ago, there's times when Satan will quote the Word of God and quote it correctly. To try to entice people, to catch them off guard. He will pretend that we contradict ourselves. And that we are perverting the truth. That's what Satan tries to make us visualize. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, in verse 16, it says, Also in all his epistles, Peter talking about the Apostle Paul, in all his epistles, speaking of them and these things, which are same things hard to understand, that they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So sometimes, definitely scriptures are too hard to understand, and Satan knows that. And we know that he preys upon those individuals that may be unlearned or individuals that may be unstable at a particular time in their life. In the scriptures, we see where he causes many to be weak and to falter. However, look what the end result is their own destruction. That's where Satan wants you and I. I want you to look in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, or the sixth chapter. In Ephesians chapter six, beginning there in verse 10. <coughs> Ephesians six and verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, Paul said, and in the power of his might. Then he says, verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God, portraying a Roman soldier, preparing for battle. 
We're in a battle. He says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood and against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness. Then he tells us down in verse 14, he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, which is the word of God. And he says, Having your blessed plate of righteousness, that is, in doing what's right, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He said, Above all, having the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then he said, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, we must resist Satan. Notice there in verse 11 that I just read, it says, Put on that whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of Satan or the old devil. We need to use all that God has given us, all that He's provided us. We need to be able to use the whole armor that God has given us to resist Satan as we're confronted with him, that we might be able to ward off the evils. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, in verse 6, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. This is a promise that we have, that if we are a Christian, the Spirit of God dwells within each of us. This is part of our armor that's to be used to ward off Satan. And notice there in verse 17 in that text that we just read, he says, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Jesus used that on all three occasions that he was tempted. He said, it is written. And so the more that we know about God's will and His Word, the more power that the sword of the Spirit has in our life. You see, there is a comfort in being a Christian. Knowing that you have God on your side is so important because Jesus is always there for us. In Matthew 11 and verse 28, He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And He said, I will give you rest. All of us want to go to heaven. I know Satan is trying to keep us from going to heaven. But all of us want to go. And remember what Jesus said in John 14 and 6. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one cometh to the Father but by me. So it's through Jesus Christ. To be in Christ tonight, we want to remind everyone how to be in Christ and how to receive that promise of eternal life. We need to ask that same question that the Philippian jailer asked there in jail with Paul and Silas. In Acts the 16th chapter, verse 30, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a question that each and every one of us need to ask. We need to believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We must be willing to repent of the sins in our life. Luke 13 and 3, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We must be willing to confess the glorious name of Jesus in Romans the 10th chapter and verse 10. And so the Lord will add us to the church when we're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. And we must be faithful. Remember, Satan is coming after us at that point more than ever. But remember what Jesus said in Matthew, or Matthew the 10th chapter and verse 22. He said this to his disciples. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus says, Be faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Where do you stand in the sight of God? Do you have God on your side or is Satan overpowering your life? Whatever need that you have tonight, I pray that you will respond 
as we stand and sing.